All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Nicolas Melo, and I'm a director of AI research at Unity Labs. Prior to, prior to joining Unity, I spent two decades of my life developing uh, automated planning systems for autonomous robots, self-driving cars, autonomous planes, and uh, planetary exploration rovers. Automated planning is a systematic way to solve decision-making problems and to generate behavior. It has been used with lots of success in uh, other industrial application domains, such as autonomous robotics. But for some reason, it didn't really make it to games. And um, so at the same time I was developing this application for robotics, I was spending most of my spare time playing video games <laughs> and, and dreaming to have a chance one day to propose automated planning tools for game AI. So it is a huge pleasure for me to introduce the next talk. The next talk is about the first integrated end-to-end -end system based on automated planning to develop game AIs in your Unity games. We believe that it will uh, revolutionize the way you design your AI, and it will even change the way you think about AI. It proposes a completely new authoring workshop, workflow for your game AIs in Unity, and it, it brings to life the promises of uh, more adaptable and more intelligent AI in your Unity games. So, let me introduce to you the real heroes of automated planning in games, Amir Ebrahimi, Amir Ebrahimi and Trevor Santara. Thank you all for coming to the session. Uh, I'm Trevor. Uh, let me just do a quick poll, as is very common in talks. Uh, how many of you have put AI in games? OK, a good number of you. I would say that was a good you know, 40 or 50 of you. That's really great. Now, uh, how many of you have used uh, behavior trees or finite state machines? OK, now, what about planning systems? Very few, only a handful, maybe three or four. So today, we're going to be talking about behaviors. And I want to be clear, when we're talking about behaviors, we're talking about a sequence of actions that we want our agents or some intelligent component of our game to make. And depending on the scale at which we're looking, uh, these decisions can look very differently. So at, at the very lowest level of this figure, we might have something like animation. We're trying to decide how to animate a character at every frame, 60 frames a second. Uh, above that, we might have a navigation system that's choosing waypoints for our agent to move between as it's trying to go to some destination. Uh, beyond that, we may have tactics or activities that the agents are participating. And even beyond that, we may have things like quest generation or the coordination of multiple agents. Um, and so we have this nice hierarchical breakdown that also has its own time, temporal components, where we have very quick decisions at the lowest level and very like, long-term decisions at the highest level. So generally, when we author AI for games, we author them in a paradigm called reactive AI. And what we mean by reactive AI is that we are programming in directly the behavior that we want out of our AI. And we may do this like in a C-sharp script, where we're taking in the state of our game, and we're checking on certain things. Is there a player in range? You know, are we in the middle of combat? And then trying to output an action that we'd like the agent to take. Now, of course, if you're not a programmer, you might use a tool like a finite state machine to do this. You may also use a behavior tree. These are two very common tools. But in the end, these are just visual programming tools for getting the same type of control flow or logic for our characters. Now, uh, there are trade-offs, as with any tool. One is these are completely controllable. You author in exactly the behavior that you want out of your AI. Now, the disadvantage there is that for very complex games with a lot of conditions that you might want to be reasoning over, is they, you might have a lot of checks that you might need to make, need, sorry, need to make and they're very tedious to author in. Um, the other drawback is that if you're iterating on your game design and things are constantly changing as you design your game, you have to constantly upgrade them with, with new factors, new considerations to make. And these types of systems don't always work for all the problems that we would want them to. And let me give you a very concrete example that I think will make a lot of sense, and that is if we go back to this diagram, navigation. Can you write a finite state machine or a behavior tree or a C-sharp script that will find the shortest distance between two points on a nav mesh or a road map or you know, whatever else you're doing navigation on? And the answer is no. It's, it's really impossible to do so. 
we handle navigation in a very different way than we would with finite state machines or with behavior trees. And that is that we create a representation of all the places in our level that we can navigate and how they are connected. And we hand this model of the problem to an algorithm that performs search in order to find the shortest path between two points. And we do this very robustly. But can we do, okay, so this type of paradigm of AI decision making is called deliberative AI. And that's in con contrast to reactive AI because we're not specifying what behavior we want out. We're instead creating a model of the problem that we want to solve and giving it to a specialized algorithm that will try to solve that problem. So can we use this type of approach for behavior at other levels, not just navigation? Can we make a search algorithm that solves a behavioral problem where we need to make a sequence of decisions to accomplish a goal? And the answer is yes. Uh, it may be a little unintuitive. I'm going to walk you through a quick example of how we would do that. Consider that we have a game where we have an agent that is currently at some woods, and he has a key to his house, and he has a fatigue level of, say, three. And in this particular game, uh, let's say the agent, if it ever has a fatigue of 10 or more, it dies. And we want our agent to eventually travel to some fields. But to go directly to the fields from the woods might incur a certain amount of fatigue, say eight, that would bring his fatigue up to a deadly level where he would die. So we must consider the alternate actions that he could take. Maybe he will travel to a tower that is closer to the woods than the fields, or to a house. And from there, we can consider what he would do next. He may enter the house, which consumes the key, because it's a game and it's one time use. Uh, but once he's in the house, he may sleep, and this can reset his fatigue to zero. And at which point, he may finally be able to have enough fatigue budget that he may travel to the fields, which was the original goal. So this is how search looks at the behavioral level, not just at the navigation level. We can represent the state of the world, and we can consider the actions and how they will change that state, um, and we can see the trade-offs, or not the, the costs that are involved. And this isn't a new idea. Planning has been used in games, although it's not very common. I think that um, it's, you know, it's not something you see in a lot of games. Uh, if you're familiar with goal-oriented action planning, it was a very popular planning implementation that was used in the game Fear to much success, and you got highly adaptable AI that used a very similar framework for making decisions. But these types of applications require a lot of work. You have to create a representation of your game and its state. You have to create representations of the actions. Then you have to implement an algorithm that tries to solve this as, as efficiently as possible. And as an old game AI teacher, I know that this is very hard for people that are uh, not experienced with AI. But we want to change this. We want to make planning accessible for everyone. And so I want to give you an overview of how our system works and how we can start giving this to other developers who don't need to know anything about how planning works in order to use planning in their games. So this is a very high level overview of how our system interacts with your game. So on the very far side, you'll have your game that you have designed. We have a planning algorithm that can solve problems and return plans. We have a controller that can monitor the state of the game, hand that off to a planner, receive a plan in return, and then execute that plan. And above it all, we have a planning domain language. And this is really the, the new component that allows us to get this in the hands of kind of any developer that wants to use this technology. A planning domain language is a representational language in which we can model problems that we want a planner to solve. And this means that we don't have to create specialized instances of states and actions and planners for each individual game that we'd want to use a planning system in. Instead, we can create one generic representation of how to model various kinds of problems. And our planning system can then attempt to solve any problem that we'd want that is expressed in that language. And I know that seems very nebulous. I'm going to hand it over to Amir now, who's going to walk you through the particular language that we use in our demo. Thank you, Trevor. So in our, in our system, we have a trait-based planning domain language. And for our, uh, for our research, we looked at a game that many of you might know of, which is Overcooked. So Overcooked is this game where you have four human players in a kitchen together, chaotically grabbing ingredients and 
chopping things up and throwing them in pots and then cooking the wrong thing and then having to throw that away and then chopping up some more ingredients. And the goal is to serve as many dishes as you can before the time runs out. Now this is an interesting problem from a planner's perspective because there's a lot of decisions that are made uh, in the course of completing one of these uh, rounds of the game. And uh, this will become more apparent as we uh, dig in a little deeper. So with our trait-based planning domain language, this is, the key feature of this language is being able to tag objects with traits. And what that allows us to do is we can affix any number of traits to these objects. In this case, we're looking at two. So we have a carryable trait and a carrier trait. And what, allows, what that allows us to do is it allows us to create actions which can form larger behaviors um, and then filter objects that, are, that become candidates for that action. So of all the objects in our world, only the ones that have a carrier trait or a carryable trait would be used in this action for pickup. What it also allows us to do is give these same traits to other objects that aren't the same thing. So in this case, we have an onion, and we also have a dirty plate. And because we can tag both of those objects with that carryable trait, they're both candidates for this pickup action. And likewise, we can do the same thing on the carrier side. So we can have another agent who's also a carrier, and that makes that object or that uh, character also a candidate for this action. And so if we go a layer deeper and we look at what traits have, traits have properties. And on these properties, that's, that's, that's really the meat of it. Like it allows us to define properties for each of the traits, assign values to those properties, and that's where the actions really operate on. So in this first example, we've got a pickup action. So initially, we don't care about the other traits on the object. So our agent actually has three traits, the, the localized trait, the carrier trait, and the actor trait. But for the action of pickup, we only need to know about carrier and carryable. So it doesn't matter what other traits are on the object. And initially, the state of the carrier is the carrier is not carrying anything. And then the carryable is located somewhere else. And we're going to go pick that object up. So after the action takes effect, then we've modified the property values of each of these traits. So the carrier reflects this relationship. It's now carrying the onion. And likewise, the onion's reflecting that same relationship in its property value. So formally, traits allow us to define a planning state, which is a set of objects where we have traits attached to each of these objects and then values for each of these properties of those traits. And then the, when an action has an effect on one or many of these objects, the planning state changes and we have a new planning state. And then formally, an action would, be, would have three main things, parameters, preconditions, and effects. So parameters are just that, the objects that are, we, we constrain in terms of the traits that we require of what objects would be candidates for an action and then preconditions on those traits. So certain rules that you might have in your game or application about what, uh, what must be necessary for those objects to be considered candidates again. And then finally, if the action takes effect, what those effects would be. So we might create or delete objects in our world. We might add or remove traits from those objects. Or we might simply just modify the property values. So we'll take a, a look deeper at one of those actions. So our pickup action has three parameters. It has agent, object, and location. So that's the who, what, and, and where of, of, of this action. So with each of those objects, we define traits that must be on those objects for them to be considered uh, for binding those to those, uh, to those parameters. Now the preconditions for this is, are, are would, you know, are that the agent wouldn't be carrying something, so we check for that. Also that the location that we're going to, the agent is actually there before the pickup tries, before the agent actually tries to pick up something. And that the location we're traveling to is actually carrying the object. 
And I'll, I'll mention here too, there's a cost associated with each action. And the cost is reflective of, you know, of those parameters and what might be involved with um, executing that action. So obviously picking up something very close would cost less than picking up something very far away. And that becomes important, uh, and Trevor will go into that more with uh, when we try and minimize cost across all of the possible actions that could be taken. And finally, we have the effects of the action. So after, uh, after this action has taken effect, we now modify the property values, as you can see. The agent reflects that relationship of carrying the object, and the location is no longer carrying the object. OK, so with our planning domain language, we now have a, rep a universal representation of state and of actions. And now we can perform search. So in this diagram, we have these green circles, and these represent the various states of our game that we can reach. And we reach these by taking these blue edges, which represent the actions that we have authored for our game, that say, you know, these are the actions that are possible for our agents. And our goal is to find the sequence of actions that takes us from our current state to some goal state. But beyond that, we want to find specifically the sequence of actions that uh, takes us to our goal state that has the total minimum cost. Um, so imagine in Overcooked, you're trying to make soup. So you could express your game like this, where you have actions such as travel, picking up objects, dropping them off at counters or at chopping boards, chopping, putting in a pot, cooking, that kind of thing. And if you were to represent the game this way, you would end up with about 35 actions required to make soup and to deliver it. Uh, beyond that, because you get a dirty plate in return and things may be at different locations, you'll need another seven or so actions to clean up the kitchen and get things set up so that you can do the next round. This is 42 actions total. And if any of you have ever implemented a search algorithm, uh, you'll know that this is very large. If we imagined, say, a minimum of five actions available to an agent at any state, and looking at a horizon of 42 actions that we're trying to find this plan from, uh, we end up searching a space that's roughly 5 to the 42nd. Uh, in, in other words, that'd be about 10 to the 29th. It's a huge space. Now, of course, this isn't necessarily the practical use of a plan planning algorithm. Um, we don't necessarily want to just make soup. Um, and we could do it this way. And in fact, our, our first pass at this game was in this kind of representation. And we were able to make soup, and that was great. And it achieved one star. If you're familiar with Overcooked, you know that three stars is the best you can get, and one star is kind of the minimum you'd want. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we get to more stars? How can we better leverage planning to optimize the actions that we take in order to make soup as fast as we can? So let's think about how a good overcooked player plays overcooked. And that is that players choose intelligently where they prep food, where they place objects, when they move things closer to each other. And we want to utilize this in representing our game so that the, the AI planner can make such decisions on its own. So we need to choose intelligently which parameters go into an action, which objects do we consider, what, what locations do we consider. And beyond that, we also want to add the ability for the planner to choose what we call optimization actions. And what we mean here are actions that may not have an immediate benefit or may not immediately accomplish a goal, but may set us up for better success with all the actions that come after it. Furthermore, because we have this huge horizon problem, perhaps expressing the game in these kind of granular, what we call micro actions of traveling, picking things up, may not be the best strategy. And instead, we might, we might want to consider macro actions. Uh, we know, for example, oh, let me go back here. So every player gets this image at the beginning of the level when they're learning the game, and it tells them how to make soup. You take three onions, you chop them, you put them in a pot. We want to be able to use that kind of knowledge in the planning system you know, to get the AI up to speed with what a player knows. So we can compose sequences of small actions into one larger action, a macro action. Another takeaway that we would want in a, you know, modeling a domain is that we want to make sure that we're branching on the right thing. We don't want to give too many options to the planner, right? That's the first way to have failure in a planning system. We want to make sure that our choices are important. And in this case, it's not the sequence of actions that matter. We know how to make soup. What matters are the parameters that are involved. So we need to make sure that we're branching on the right thing. And the last thing is we want to allow these optimization actions, actions that allow us to have some delayed benefit later on. So let me walk you through a couple of examples. 
So one idea or one example of a macro action uh, that we've created is called prepare food and add to pot. And this is in contrast to picking up an object, dropping it off, et cetera. This action is responsible for going to a location, picking up a new food, taking it to a chopping board, chopping it, and then going to a pot and putting it in the pot, all in one. It only takes four parameters. But we know that this is a good sequence of actions because we're using you know, the knowledge we have as designers or as players of this game. As for an optimization action, we might consider like moving an object. Moving an object isn't necessarily something you would think of. It's not in the diagram, you know, moving from one place to another. But this allows us to shorten dis the distances that we travel later on. So the move object simply says that an agent can go to an object, pick it up, and then take it somewhere else. So let's show you how this works. All right, so this is, uh, this is a, this is a early version of our UI. It's not the final UI, but this is how you would, uh, this is where in practice as a designer you would design your domain. So initially you would start with the data definition. So in this case we're just defining the traits that we're going to use in our game and potentially additional types, um, enumerations essentially for any uh, specific states you need to track. So as I mentioned before, there was the carryable trait. And we, can, we specify the name for the traits. We can also specify a number of fields that we want to add to the trait. So in this case, we have carried by. And you can specify the type, of, um, uh, the type for that trait property. And essentially, we also have here, you know, here's the carrier trait. So that's where we define that. Um, it's also possible to set, you know, define food state enumerations um, or, I mean, custom enumerations. In this case, we have a state for our ingredients. They could either be raw, chopped, or in the soup. So we need to represent that in our domain definition. So now moving over to our behavior, this is where we and by the way, this is a custom uh, view that I've created. These are just assets on disk like any other asset. You can uh, drop, you can ta uh, pin these tabs to any part in the Unity editor. Um, so these are all separate files, so we define our, our domain definition separately from behaviors. And this allows us to swap out different behaviors on agents that we have. So this uh, behavior right here is just the micro action version that Trevor was talking about. And we have a bunch more actions in this, such as picking up new food, picking up an object, dropping an object, chopping it, adding to pot. And as we mentioned, there are parameters, preconditions, and effects in those. But where things really got interesting for us is when we went to the macro actions. Because again, 5 to the 42 is, like, is a really large number. If you ever look at this policy graph as it's being expanded, you know, at any point, the agent can tra travel to one of 19 locations, and it just it explodes. So is that the best use of the planner? No, not really. So instead, we group a lot of those actions into uh, these macro actions, and that allows us to make better decisions with the planner. So in the case of one of these optimization actions, moving objects around is something that can happen in the planner, because it might decide that having an object closer to the cutting board would actually be optimal. And so if we look at this action, we have our parameters. We have the destination we're moving the object to, the object itself, the initial location, and the agent. So let's look at destination. In this case, we have two required traits, the location and the carrier trait. So this is a little bit, uh, in, in the slides I showed, it was a very simple version of this, and now we're going into the actual uh, version that we use. Um, so, in practice, you might have many locations that can carry objects, but the burner is not somewhere where you want to set an ingredient. So that doesn't make sense. So I, we have the ability to set prohibited traits on objects. So in this case, I don't want any objects that have the return or burner trait. Um, and I'll skip the rest of the parameters, but I hope you can see how you can define the, uh, the parameters for your actions. And then we have the preconditions. And this is where you can set which object, uh, set pr uh, the requirements for the trait parameter, uh, trait properties that must be set for this action to be considered valid for them. Um, in this case, you know, that the object's being carried by the initial location, and so on. And finally, we have the effects, which are also 
just the results of this action. Um, you would set all the effects that you want to have happen. So up until now, I've been describing a descriptive model of our domain. And by domain, it's our game. It's our game rules. It's almost our game design in this form. We've represented this. Um, but what's important to note is that's all happening in the planner space. That's happening when the planner is figuring out what's the best way to achieve my goal. But where it meets the game is where we, I'm going to de define a new term, operational model. That's, that's where we need to have game logic for that. So for each action, you can, define, uh, you can define a class that will implement that operational model. And in this case, we have one that we've exposed called move object. So I'm going to hop over to code just so you can see what that looks like. So it implements an interface. And what does that interface have? It has a begin execution, a continue execution method, and an end execution method. And then finally, a status method to let the planner, well, the controller, know where we are with this action and actually having it play out in the game. And if you're familiar with animation controllers, you know, for instance, Mechanim, this is very similar with the finite state machine in, in that system. You would define those similar methods. So just I'll point out that the C-sharp code in these methods is very specific to your game. In this case, we've built up some behavior utilities that allow us to play the, the game, and, and we actually emulate how a player would play the game with pressing buttons uh, to move the character and to, uh, to interact with objects in the world. So in this case, uh, this action is pretty simple. We move the character to the initial location, we press the pickup button, we move him to the destination location, and we drop the object. So finally, it's demo time. Let's see what this, how this works in, in practice. So this is just a custom view. I've got the game running on the left. I have our policy graph visualizer on the right. So I had it pause before this agent has take, taken the first action so we could illustrate what the planner is actually doing underneath. So on the right, you can see this is our policy graph. These are all the decisions that uh, the planner is considering for the uh, for this agent to take. And we've limited it to the top three, but if I expand the graph, even with just those few moments, it's already tried a lot of different permutations of what this agent could do and found an optimal path through those. So if I zoom this back down, we'll see that it had many decisions about moving objects up front. And one of them was to move the pot to one of many locations in, in this world. But the optimal one it chose is to move the pot next to the cutting board. Because as you chop and put things in the pot, it's, the, it's really the best decision to make. And this is where we want to make use of the planner in its best form, making those intelligent decisions out of many different options. So I'll just let it run. You'll see the planner is con continually planning. It's executing actions. It's updating future states, uh, planner states. And ultimately, I'm just going to drop the scale a bit. Ah, OK. So yeah, it's a little more visible. Um, ultimately, it will deliver soup. And it takes about four minutes for this to run through. So we're not going to all sit here in awkward silence and just watch. <laughs> but what I will say is that um, uh, what's interesting to note is we do hit two stars on this. And this is a level where you actually need two characters to get three stars. So I think, I think what we found is probably the optimal solution for yeah. at least one character. For one character. One character, two stars. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So there it goes on the next one. OK, let's go back to slides. OK, so let's talk about the system that we're going to try to deliver in the near future. Um, one is. The, perhaps the most important part is that we have created this rich and hopefully extremely expressive domain language that we think will work across a variety of games. It's not going to be specialized to any one game. And we hope that you know, maybe in your own games, you're already thinking about how you could express such in our trait-based domain language. Um, the other thing that comes with the system are these initial authoring and debugging tools. So you can see the plans. You can navigate around. Maybe it's making a decision you don't like. And you can go and inspect exactly what went into that decision. And we think that that'll create a really intuitive and easy-to-use system that you can iterate on and tweak the design of. 
Uh, under the hood, we're running a planning algorithm that's based on trial-based heuristic tree search, which is a generalization of a family of planning algorithms, including Monte Carlo tree search, if any of you have heard of that. And while it doesn't come up in Overcooked, the system also handles planning under uncertainty, which is something that's been missing in a lot of AI planning systems for games. And what we mean by planning under uncertainty is that sometimes your actions might have multiple different results, each with their own likelihood. Consider you have an attack action. Well, you don't necessarily always want to say that an attack succeeds. There may be some chance of failure. Maybe it misses or it gets blocked. And you know, you might want to consider the risk involved in that uncertainty. And our, and our system also handles that. We want to give a special thank you to Team 17 and Ghost Town Games for letting us use Overcooked for our demo. We want to stress that this is not a feature that's coming in Overcooked. It's just something we did for research. Uh, but it's been a, a blast to play with, and it's great to see you know, a little AI making soup. And um, oh, just as some, some extra information, because we know we're going to get this when we move to the questions, we are looking at releasing around GDC as an experimental project. It's already in a working state. We are open to the idea of having some early adopters. So if you're interested in playing around with this technology, please get in touch with us. You can email us at ai.research at unity3d.com, or you can uh, talk to us after the session. I also encourage you to follow Unity Labs on Twitter. Labs is the larger research group in, in, uh, in Unity, and we're just one team on that. And there's a lot of really exciting projects out there. And you can see all of the recent updates on that, that Twitter account. So with that, I think we'll move to questions. Um, thank you. <laughs> and our planner is still going. It's still not done. It's still working. But it's so I see some people already lining up. But uh, please remember, we have microphones on the aisles. So if you want to ask a question, please go over there. Great work, guys. Um, I, I had a question about the um, domain actions and where it might overlap with um, the Playables API. And if you've given any consideration as to how to kind of incorporate both. Um, well, it's interesting to note that I'm using a, a visualizer that was meant for playables. Um, it's not uh, directly on the roadmap, but there, as with all things Unity, we'd love to have our own systems integrate really well. So um, it's cer certainly something we'll, you know, we're looking at. Thank you. All right, question over here. Uh, how fault tolerant is your planner? Like, if the other player is like moving the pot and like stealing onions and stuff. Is your planner able to cope with that? Yeah, so what we didn't get to talk about is that there's constantly being updates to the state on, in the controller that monitors when things get moved around, perhaps even unexpectedly. And those will trigger the controller to go back to the planner and say, oh, well, this isn't what I expected. Let's try to replan, try something new. And we have uh, really great support for replanning, because this is always going to come up when you have a player in your game. And I mean, that's why we make games, right? <laughs> Uh, a couple questions. The first one, when you were showing the location earlier, mm -hmm. uh, I wondered why you didn't set, like, it seems like there needs to be another check of whether another player is currently targeting that location, whether you should choose it. Yeah, absolutely. And then <laughs> that kind of made me think, well, I mean, coordination between the two players is, when I was playing Overcooked the other day, is like the most important mm -hmm piece of it, so like, how do you plan to build coordination between the different agents into the system? Ah, what a great question. So I actually do multi-agent coordination as like my PhD research. Sweet. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, one is you can have one planner plan for both agents. Then you have perfect coordination. That is often the easiest, but sometimes it's tricky to express. Another thing is you can take like a Blackboard system. And any time an agent has a plan and it needs to possibly reserve stations or locations, uh, you can post to that Blackboard. And then when another agent is planning, they can go and read and say, like, oh, well, I, I can't use these because they're going to be used. Right? Um, it gets a little tricky with a player in the loop, yeah. though, right? because they're not exactly broadcasting their intentions. Yeah. So this is something that you have to deal with at the design level, is like, where can the player interfere with your AI, and how do you want the AI to adapt to that? And so that's going to be on a per-game basis. And, and sometimes it's really hard, but sometimes you need also maybe a bit of communication between the player and the AI. So I, I hope that answers your question. It is a very hard thing to deal with in practice. Got it. Uh, that was basically my question. Uh, <laughs> but I'm already up here, so uh, I'm going to ask another one based on that. Uh, You've got, uh, you're working on collaborative uh, agents, but what about, 
how do I put it? Uh, the game theory behind it, uh, like where uh, where they have to make decisions based off of what they expect with a, 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 from the other one to make without knowledge of the the strategy they chose. Absolutely, I love these questions. Well, by the way, they're uncertain. Um, I'm glad we I'm glad we like planted <laughs> the audience. <laughs> yeah. So so like I mentioned before, we do handle planning uh, under uncertainty. But if you're talking about uncertainty that's specific to what another agent or player may be doing, you need to incorporate that in your your model, right? You need to model some predictions of what they may be doing and uh, you know, assign some likelihoods to that. Maybe you mine that data out from gameplay data. Maybe you just hand author it and make a, a guess. But technically, if you can model it, this will reason about that uncertainty. OK, thank you. Um, how do you calculate cost? Like, is that something that's going to be open to us as a tool, much like the actions? Uh, yeah. Because yeah. Yes, absolutely. So. Um, Another point we didn't get to go into in much detail. So in the authoring tool, if you just have a flat cost for an action, you can just assign it. On the back end, we actually take that, all the things that you specify in our authoring, and we generate code with it. Um, Amir, do you want to pull this up? Yeah, I was just going to show there's currently a cost field in um, cost reward, depending on how you want to view it. But yeah, there's a cost field in the authoring tool, but that's, a, that's just a simple right. cost. Right, so that's Obviously. where you do a, a flat cost. Now, so we take this and we generate code. You can actually go in and implement a specific function that makes modifications to this value. And that's what we do in Overcooked, because we don't want a flat cost for everything. We actually then, we take our cost, and then we subtract the amount of distance that's traveled by the agent, and that's how we get it to minimize the total distance traveled. So great question. Yeah. Well, I ran out of questions because already. The same question? Huh? Oh. oh, well, the, the, I ran out of questions because both people just got to uh, multi agent search and it was talking, uh, asking about that. So, uh, great work. Okay. I'm sorry, what? I was going to ask about multi agent search. Yes. But the people that asked the questions before me, yeah, that Ask was. That's so, okay. congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I care very much about multi-agent search. That's a personal bias. But uh, I hope maybe our next demo will be a more multi-agent. Hi. I want to ask, is there anywhere in the roadmap where you're going to integrate ML agents into the system? So instead of us having to program discreetly the macro and optimization actions, that they will be self-discovered. So we can just put in the micro, uh, the, the micro actions so we don't have to worry about the macro part itself. Yeah, sure. If, if, if you don't want to implement the actual control side, you know, the operational side, um, you could easily wrap something with ML agents to do that control oh, yeah. for you. Uh, it might be a little tricky because it need, the action also needs to report, like, if it's currently in progress or if something has invalidated the action or, you know, if the action's complete. So that may be a bit tricky, but I, I'm sure you could do it. Cool. Thank you. Hey, um, do you support suboptimal planning in terms of, like, difficulty tuning, yep. things like that? Yes, absolutely. So there's a lot of different knobs in this system. Um, at, at the very simplest thing is you can always make the planner plan less, right? So this actually uses an iterator, iterative pl planner. And the more it plans, the better the plans get. And so if you want to tune that, you can directly just you know, cut how much time there is. Beyond that, it gets a, a little bit tricky. You could tweak costs to you know, bias the preferences that it explores. Um, but I would, I would ask maybe if it would be better tackled from the design approach. Maybe you give it suboptimal actions only to consider, um, rather than giving it the full suite of actions it could take. And that would actually be, I think, a stronger way of authoring suboptimal behaviors. Thanks. There's also the possibility you could just select not the optimal path through your policy graph, but maybe the next best or the next best beyond that. That's that true. That's true. You, you could tweak the, the planner directly and say, like, well, don't take the best action. Take the second best action. Or, or or bias the cost. Yeah, there's, oh, there's so many things you yeah. can do. Um, so I noticed that your. Uh, hold, hold on oh, one sorry. second. He wanted to add in yeah, real yeah. quick. Yeah. So we, because we have a planning domain, uh, a, re a representation of the Nico, into the mic. Mike. Mike. Is it recording this? Oh, it doesn't Mike work. is up. Oh, oh there you go. <laughs> okay. Because we have a planning domain, so we have a representation of the rationality, uh, we can make actually mistakes that make sense. Uh, we could, uh, or oh, the, the agent forget that this could happen. You know, you have planning under uncertainty. So when you do when you do something, you have to make the list of all the possible outcomes. So we could neglect one, and that would be a way to create an agent which is less optimal. Um, so we can make mistakes which have sense, and that the player can actually interpret. All right. All right. 
Question? Um, so I noticed as uh, the AI was going through and doing its task to get to its ultimate goal, it has downtime. So while, for example, the onions are cooking, is there a way that's so working linearly that it can take on second goals and then multi-thread them essentially to be more productive overall? Yeah, I mean, that, that honestly just comes down to what actions you've authored for. We, we authored an action, this kind of macro action that has it just sit with the pot, right? This is not actually a, you know, an optimal thing to do. Any good player would drop the pot off and go and run and come back, right? Um, so you could author actions that divide it up in a different way, and then it would have the ability to do so. You might also consider something like temporal modeling, which you could do in our framework, uh, to let it reason about how much time is left, and then see if it could go grab a thing, chop it, and come back to it in time, and let it make that decision. The option is used, or yours. It's totally up to how you want to author your domain and your action represent, or the actions that you wanted to, to consider. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Question over here? Yeah, um, so apart from the obvious approachability of this kind of a user interface, were there underlying algorithmic aspects to why you elected to go this route rather than something like um, wrap, putting a visual wrapper around an existing AI-oriented or rules-oriented uh, for GL? Yeah, I mean, so you know, one of the, the points we like to make is the contrast between you know, re reactive and deliberative, and that is really down to, does your AI need to consider what might happen in the future, right? Because that's where you need to have some kind of an anticipation of what would happen as an effect of your actions. And rule-based systems and finite state machines and behavior trees, it's very hard to encode that, that anticipation that in the future, I, I may need to make a consideration that affects my decision now. So that, that's why we decided to take this approach. Also because, you know, um, there haven't been a lot of planning systems in games, particularly not for, for general use, and we think that we can create one with a state-of-the-art planning algorithm and see where that takes us. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey, um, thinking about online multiplayer and how this, this is a client-side solution, because some part you want to move into the server side, not to be open to hacking and all the things, so all the decision-making, can, can, can it be moved to the server side? Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, the, the planner itself, uh, Trevor wrote most of that, and it's, it's just pure C sharp, so it's not dependent on Unity being even running. Even, like, even if you were to run Unity headless on a server, you don't have to do that. You could just run it in yeah. C sharp instance. And, and on that note, we can actually run the planner offline. You give it a domain description and let it plan for maybe a long time. Maybe it's a, a problem that's impractical to do in real time. You run it offline, and then you can actually serialize the plan and then load it into your game and just use it from the offline run. Hi. Uh, I just want to say that I slept yesterday at 1 AM working on a uh, goal-oriented uh, action <laughs> planner. Uh, very naive uh, implementation. But my question is, why goal-oriented action planner is not adopted as much as it should be? Ooh, so, I'm going to let Nico take this yeah, one Nico because he loves this question. <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> We have been thinking about that a lot. Oh. We have two minutes. Yeah. OK, I have several elements of response. I'm going to start with this one. Um, so first thing, we come to you. We say with planning, you're going to be able to make AI. Nico, mic. I use the mic. <laughs> uh, maybe I can. But this should be our last question, by the way. We're out of time. OK, no. Yeah, that's working. OK, yeah. so we're telling you with planning, you're going to be able to make AI even on problems you don't know how to solve. Even you just need to know how to describe um, the problem, and then it's awesome, right? So that's cheap AI. Uh, but to be able to have this cheap AI, you need to have a controller, you need to have a solver, uh, which is doing planning under uncertainty. And if you have a, and you also have a language management to allow this thing to be reused over many games. So the initial investment and, uh, and the heavy AI machinery, which is behind this system, was very kind of turned on many people. Uh, if you are just making a game, you can really question if it's worth doing it. And that's why, so, first thing, because previously, there was no planning or domain language which would allow people to reuse the same AI over multiple games that would make this investment not worthwhile. Second element of answer. Um, previous attempt at using planning, so mostly GOAP, couple of uh, experiments in uh, real-time strategy games. Most of them, if not all, uh, we are not allowing you to model uncertainty. 
Ah, so as we told you, we can represent uncertainty in our action. So we can say, I'm, gonna, I'm going to attack the, the player. I might win or lose. What happens if you assume that you're always going to win? Well, you're going to do something crazy, right? And if you assume you're always going to lose, you're going to do nothing. So there is no good behavior that can emerge for combat if you don't take into account the fact that actions may have different possible outcomes. This is true for fighting. This is true for exploration. If you plan for exploration, I'm going to go there. If I find what I'm looking for, I'm going to do that. Else, I'm going to keep on exploring. Just to reason about that, you need to be able to represent the uncertainty in the action, which was not present in a GOAP and other games. So without this ability to represent this element in your games, you're very limited in what you can do. I think that's also another reason. Uh, so people, I hear stuff like, oh, GOAP is good to make so short plans. Yes. People use GOAP to make short plans. I'm going to make a plan to go there, see if I find what I'm looking for. And if not, I'm going to replan. Oh, I'm just missing the uncertainty in my representation that I could make a big plan because I have uncertain action in my plan. Thank you, Nika. <laughs>